It would. Glad you there. You're on mute if you are. Hey, Doug. Good morning. Hey, how's it going? Fine. I got a new audio setup, and I'm trying to see how this performs, and I'm clicking the wrong buttons. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. Doo -doo -doo. I can't remember. Where are you located? Bucharest, Romania. Oh, that's right, Romania. Okay. Hey, David. Hey, David. Hey, good morning. How's it going? How's it going? Doing well. That is good. How's your day going, Doug? Mm, it's OK. Looking forward to the weekend, though. You're not in California with the fires, are you? No, I'm on the East Coast, North Carolina. Yeah, actually, it's, uh, it's cooling off a lot here, so it's nice. As somebody that has been living with like the AC turned on to max, I am jealous. <laughs> yeah. Every now and then over the last week or so, it's gotten really hot and humid to the point where like all the windows in my house start fogging up, which is really a weird experience. Hey, Tommy. Yo. Yo. A little bit odd, small group today so far. Hey, Christian. Morning, Dad. Hey, Eric. Hi, Doug. How's it going? Pretty decent morning. How about yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, I have actual sunlight here. <laughs> you must be in California. Yes, yes. It was, it felt like, I don't know, um, it felt well, like it was sundown all of yesterday, the entirety wow. of yesterday. Are you in Northern California or Southern California? Northern. Northern, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Hey, Timur. Hey, Doug, how are you? Good. Slinky. Hey, love. Hello. And Mr. Mark. Hi, Doug. Hello. And Klaus. Hi, Doug. Hello. And Anish. Hey, Doug. Hello. And Scott. Duck, duck, duck. Duck, duck, duck. Thomas. Hello. Hello. Did I spell your name right? 
Perfect. Thanks. There we go. Yeah, it's a miracle. <laughs> uh, Brian, are you there? Hello. Hello. Christoph. Hi. Hello. And well, are you there? And well? Yes, hello. Hello, and Lance. Hello, I'm here. Hello. All right, I think I had everybody so far. I was actually hoping Clemens would show up because I wanted, apparently he was on the uh, protobuf call and I was hoping to get an update from him. Let me ping him. Daniel, are you there? Hello. Hello. Hamid? I'm here. Hi. Uh, hello. All right, one more minute, I'll get started. I actually have a very short agenda today. All right, let's go ahead and get this thing started. Um, doo -doo -doo. All right, community time. Anything from the community people want to bring up? I actually have a question. Mm -hmm. This might have uh, come up uh, earlier already and I might have missed it. Um, what about uh, WebSocket support? Any thoughts from anyone on the call or from you, Doc? I'm trying to remember if this has come up before. I want to say it has, but for the life of me, I can't remember what we said about it. Does anybody remember? Or anybody have any comments? Yes. Uh, the last time we talked about it, uh, there was an agreement uh, to work on it. Uh, it was me, Scott, and Lance, and right? And if you scroll down, you should see in the previous meeting minutes. Oh, that's right. We did, didn't we? Where is it? I think it was two weeks ago, maybe. Oh, okay, might have missed that. Yeah, now that you mentioned that, I do remember something about that. Oh, there we go. Yeah, this one, this one. Yeah. Climates too. Perfect. Is there an up any, any update on that in terms of status, or is it still just sort of in the backlog? I think it's still in the backlog. Okay. Oops. All right, cool. Thank you, Thomas, for the reminder. Actually, I should add, well, I should add I that as an AI. I didn't know it is a reminder, though. No, no, this is good. I think we should add that to the um, to add for the for the reminders WebSocket proposal. Sankey, Scott, Clemens, and Lance. Cool. I like reminders. All right. Anything else from community time? Oh, Anish. Uh, can I get a reference to this backlog item? I would like to have a look at that if you don't mind. All we have is, let's see, what day was that? This was on the, come on, on the 13th of last month. We just have this in the notes. So Maybe we should we make have, an issue. Yeah, so that would be nice. Comment. Slinky, you want to make an issue so everybody can comment on it? Sure. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Oops. All right. Cool. Thank you. All right. Anything else? All right. Moving forward. <laughs> Not too surprising. No one's volunteered yet uh, for KubeCon North America. Clemens, since I see you join now, what do you think about both of us signing up and we just send in the same video we did for the previous ones? I, I think that's a brilliant idea. 
I like it. Okay, but that means that we're both then signed up to uh, answer questions live. You okay with that? Uh, what day is that? Oh, oh November seventeen yeah. twenty. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that seems like I'm yeah. not on vacation on those days. That's the important, most important thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay. Doug, we'll if you if if it doesn't work for either one of you, and you need somebody to fill in. You can add my name. This is uh, David. Um, I'm gonna need some catch up though beforehand. Um, so leave you can leave me as tentative, or you can if you need me to back up, that's fine. Okay, cool. Thank you. I I, I kind of assumed if if for, if for some reason there was a conflict, I'm sure somebody else could fill in. Right. It's just and Q and A. I remember you guys were talking about from Europe that you had nobody on. <laughs> so, <laughs> It should be a, a, a little bit. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it became very easy for us. Great, thanks. Yes. All right, cool. Thank you. Uh, let me make a note here. So I will send in the thing. Now, okay. Timur, since you're on, did you get an invite or a questionnaire that you're supposed to fill out since you're a sandbox project, or do you need to steal the serverless working group's slot? Um, <clears throat> no, I did not, but I don't know. I don't want to steal anything. So. Well, well to, I, to be honest, we, we get two, right? One for cloud events, one for serverless. Obviously the cloud events one, we can talk about everything we're doing here. We already have the video for that. Unless someone can think of a, a, of a specific topic to cover the serverless working group thing, I'm inclined to, to let you guys steal it for your workflow stuff. Sure. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If that's okay with you of guys, of course, that's, that's uh, yeah. Yeah, does anybody else have a topic they, they think should be brought up for the serverless working, working group session? Okay, so why don't we plan on you stealing that time? We'll talk offline about getting, you know, an abstract or something put together. I'm assuming we can just copy what we did from the previous one. Um, but yeah, we'll talk offline about that, okay? Sounds good, thank you. Perfect. Um, all right, something like that. I think that's close enough. Okay. All right. Um, SDK working group. I think we did have a call last week, but can anybody remember anything worth mentioning for the rest of the group? No. Nope. Okay. I can't remember. Yeah, actually, I guess I should click on the meeting minutes and see. Oh yeah, it was just the announcement from Slinky, right? So that was it. Cloud Events SDK, Java SDK 2.0, Milestone 2 is out there. All right, uh, we do have a call technically right after this one, talk with Discovery Interop. Um, please, if you have any topics, go ahead and add it to the agenda doc or to that doc itself, and then we'll see what, what happens. All right, Timur, anything you wanna bring up from the, server, from the workflow stuff to update no. us? It's been a quiet week. Well, I think on Monday in our meeting, we will just vote on a, a logo proposed by CNCF and, and then that's going to be enough work to update everything to use it. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any questions for Timur? All right. Uh, before we jump into the PRs and issues, any topics people want to bring up that I should have added to the agenda but forgot? Okay. In that case, let's jump into these two PRs. Now, technically these were opened up you know, four days ago, so they, we can't technically vote on them, but I'm inclined to let people uh, have more time to review them. Um, Cause I think we need a little more thinking, but I did wanna at least introduce them here on this call. This one is about trying to fill out some more details around our REST API. Um, most of it is around things like making it clear, Oh. Rather than talking about a generic API section, I specifically um, made it all about REST, basically, and HTTP. I figured we can add other protocols later on, but I wanted to get the REST one out there. And whether we pull this out into a separate spec or keep it here, we can discuss later. But I wanted to fill out specific details. So for example, make it clear that this is doing a get on the services, talked about, um, uh, where, where is it? In, in particular for the get for the API one, and then talk about all the specific return codes that we specifically call out. Now that doesn't mean that people can't use other HTTP response codes if they're appropriate, but these are the ones that the spec sort of mandates based upon particular situations, okay? Um, 
well, I left it open to to do because I figured that's actually a little bit bigger is how do we want to handle errors, right? Do we want to define a standardized response, JSON for errors and stuff like that? We probably do, but I didn't want to overload this PR too much. So I left that as a to do for later on. The biggest thing that I want people to think about as they read this is, especially on the puts, where is it? Yeah, I guess, okay, so for here. Um, I did have the notion of doing a create both to the services endpoint and to an endpoint that actually has, where is it? Where is it, where is it? Actually has an ID in it, okay? This one is, is oh, that's a, Delete, I apologize, scrolling too much. Okay, or you can do a put to a specific ID. This one is more focused on the import case where you don't wanna create a new ID on the fly, okay? Um, however, in both cases, I do talk about returning a 202 accepted, meaning um, the, the, the endpoint wants to do an asynchronous update or create and they can't return something quickly enough before you can start getting, before you start worrying about timeouts. So I had this whole big rambling stuff in here about how to handle asynchronous updates. In particular, it gets really interesting when you're worrying about cases where it fails, right? Because you have to have a way for the, for the client to be able to query some endpoint to get the failure status. Um, so take a look at that in, in there, because I do have a whole, bunch of semantics around how to process those. I don't want to necessarily bore you guys on the call here right now, uh, but please take a look at that, see what you think. Um, I try not to make it too funky, um, but let me go ahead and pause there for a sec, since Scott, you raised your hand. Yeah, I'm a bit confused. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely go and review the PR, but uh, why would we put CRUD on the discovery API? That's an excellent question. I assumed that when we start talking about supporting the aggregation scenarios that we'd want to have some standard way to share the metadata between it, between the discovery endpoints. I was assuming that discovery aggregation would be pull only, no push. Interesting. I was assuming potentially both. Because if you, like. so if you only support pull, then that, that uh, resource PR that you made uh, to get the resource version makes a lot of sense. Uh, for simplicity, I wonder if we go, if we go first version with no CRUD, just pull. Hmm. I hadn't thought about that. I'll, I'll need to think about it. What, are the, what do other people think? No comments at all? Does that count? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It could mean you love Scott's idea. It could mean you hate it. I don't know. I, I um, generally, I'm, sympath I'm generally sympathetic to Scott's ideas. But no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, except yeah, in yeah. this case. <laughs> um, what do we lose? I don't know. I I just have this weird feeling that that there's going to be cases where people say, you know what, I need to. I, I need to upload something into this. I don't have another endpoint for you to pull. I just need to upload some data. I need to upload some, you know, some more endpoint or um, new services. So what if there is no nothing for you to pull? I, I mm. wonder if it's it's more of a case where we could support an endpoint that says, "Yo, if you're an aggregator, here is my endpoint to pull from." Sure, but but what if? Okay, what if he's behind a firewall? Or what if? It's not necessarily an aggregation case. What if it's just, I just need to populate the, the discovery endpoint and I would like to do it in a interoperable way so that I can just, I can populate lots of discovery endpoints. Mm -hmm. Oh, like, like an IOT case or something? Hmm. Yeah. Does that have to be part of this API? Because populating the, the discovery API is not necessarily the discovery API or, or even what clients are concerned about. True. I, I don't want to have an objection to splitting it out to a separate spec. That is true. Uh, my my first the, like my first hot take here is, if we support CRUD operations on the discovery endpoint, we also need to support uh, some sort of identity to understand if the uh, if the entity pushing discovery data into some discovery endpoint is actually an authority on what it's pushing. Well, the entire discussion about security, whether you do push or pull, it needs to be talked about at some point. Or yeah, punt at least entirely. In, <laughs> in the pull case, you understand who you're trying to connect to. 
you don't understand who's connecting to you if you're accepting pushes. True, yeah. I, and to be honest, my, my assumption was that there, there would need to be some sort of security mechanism in place. And whether we talk about that or say, hey, it's up to you to decide that because there are lots of different mechanisms out there, that's up for you to decide. We, I just kind of figure we, we talk about that later, to be honest. In the IoT case, would, would it be bad if we gave a discovery API and each uh, IoT thing had to implement their own push protocol? Uh, each their own protocol is not what I'm here, why I'm here. So it would be bad. Okay. Yes. That is, if that's what that means, yes. <laughs> so, so Klaus, your hand is up. Um, yes. So I could imagine that not in all cases you would like to have this uh, CRUD parts implemented because uh, in some cases you, you might have um, a very special way to um, that you have already existing content and you just translate it and make it discoverable the standard way. But the, the way how you, you get to this content might be well, <laughs> proprietary, for example. Yeah, so actually I guess what I should do is somewhere up here. Yeah, this sentence right here, I think needs to be changed. And now, now you guys are talking, right? Because not everybody may support all the, all the CRUD APIs. So that sentence probably needs to go. Yeah. I also uh, have to review it in detail, so. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. sorry. I, I would, I would uh, um, really distinguish between the, the, I mean, you can all map them into one, um, into one namespace. I, was, I shall say, but I think of those as distinct interfaces. There's a, there's a management interface and then there's a discovery interface. Um, and, and I'm not sure that they are, are sitting in the same, in the same uh, path segment. Just to poke on that a little, just from the simplicity point of view, why would you not? Um, because all because I believe that those are also different um, security realms. But can't you secure put post versus get differently? You can. Yes, you can. But it's simpler to 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 um, secure things at the interface level rather than at the at the um, at the method level. Okay. We can definitely talk about that. I don't, I don't have a huge objection. I just wanted to poke on a little. Okay. All right, well, as I, I said. Think, I, I don't think it's gonna, it's gonna change. It's gonna be dramatic change. It's just that there is um, um, you know, some, um, some more headlines and probably it's not all under services, but we'll have to go. Right, like it might be like, you know, slash management slash services or something like that. Yeah, that's not a big deal. Um, that's fine. We can talk about that. Okay. So as I said, I didn't want to try to force this through. I think people need to look at this fairly carefully. Um, so please do get a chance um, to review it. Um, as I said, I think I think the async I think the async stuff is necessary, even though it does feel a little bit complicated. But I try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, but please, you know, look at that kind of carefully. There is a. I was just looking looking. There is another trick. Um, and I don't remember talking about this trick in this forum. I just don't, I forget what that was, what content it was. And that is, um, if you give a, if you give a 302 or 303 instead of the 202, um, you can do, we can return the retry after and uh, basically tell the client when to come back to, to um, so basically someone issues a request to you um, and then you say, you, you basically say, yep, yeah, uh, you have come to the right place, 302, but I just can't do that yet. So you give them a location header and the retry after is you tell them come back in five seconds and but then they, 
But they do get to the location header, right? Yes, they, they come through the location header. And many HTTP clients actually resolve this under the covers so that they will go and, and sit there and wait. And they will go and re-request. And then they can go and pick up the result automatically without you having to program for it. Interesting. So it sounds like it's almost the exact same thing as what I do here, except instead of a 202, it's a 302. Yeah, and it's it's either it's either um, it's either a three hundred two or three hundred three. I forget which one it is, I'm, and I'm and I'm bad reading reading along right now. Um, yeah, okay. Two. I'll make I'll, I'll take a look at that. Oh, three hundred two or three hundred seven? Hang on, there was a um, ah yeah, three hundred. It's three hundred seven. Okay. So you can you can do a three oh so you can do a three oh seven with a location header and a retry after, and that mechanism um, is 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 supposed to be picked up by the client, and for the client then to do the request again um, to that location, but after waiting the retry after um, period, and that that can. Uh, then uh, be used for asynchronous processing. Of course, if you have a giant, if you, it, this kind of semi breaks down if you were doing a giant submission of a document. Um, but um, uh, for simple requests, that's something that is, is doable. Oh, that's interesting. So, so with the 302, he doesn't do a get to that URL. He does a, another put or a post. Yes. Oh. So you can, so you can actually do a, um, there's another detail there in that you can, um, you can basically preempt the client from sending, um, the entire request to you by coming back with the, with the, this is the, the 100 continuous thing that is also in HTTP. So there's all kinds of nuances where you can go and trick, which the browsers use, where you can go and trick the, the, um, the client into into some into some behavior that then in the in the end becomes asynchronous. So that's something that's something that's some tr extra trickery that if we want to go and do trickery, we can go and use the HTTP trickery. <laughs> I like the fact you keep using the word trickery because that's what it feels like to me. And I'm trying to figure it out is. that's really really cool or really really scary. Yeah, it is. But it's like there is there's onboard capabilities that the HTTP clients must implement. Um, by the rules of HTTP. So that's, that's where, and you're kind of starting to tread into territory where um, you, are, you are now stepping into those mechanisms. Yeah, okay, something for me to think about, thank you. Um, this would also be something like the 307 trick with retry after. Um, if uh, uh, anybody still has some interns, <laughs> um, this would be a good thing to go and validate. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I know that it works. I know that it works with, with with some clients, but I don't know what the what the overall compliance is of of clients. Like I don't know what Golands um, has that. Or I mean, that's Google, so it must need to be right. But who knows? Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Thank you, Clemens. Anybody else have any high level comments? Otherwise, I'll let you folks read this offline. Okay. And thank you for the comments you guys gave already. Appreciate that. Next one, another PR. Okay, so this one was based upon last week's discussion where we talked about needing a version attribute. And to be clear, this version attribute is the version of the discovery endpoint metadata for this particular service. It is not related to the version of the service itself. Okay. And as I was writing this up, I believe originally I wrote, um, the version field, and I call it disk version or discovery version, just uh, a couple of reasons. One is I, I, I didn't just call it a version because I didn't want people to get confused about what it's the version of, right? So for example, we have spec version down here, meaning it's the cloud event version. Disk version here makes it perfectly clear, at least to me, that this was the discovery version. I don't know, if you want to like the word disk, we can call it discovery if you want. Um, but anyway, the point here is it starts at one and on each update it gets incremented by one each time, so it just continually goes up, relatively straightforward. Now, after I wrote that though, I don't know why, but I started thinking about it and realizing, you know, it might be really nice to know when the resource itself was actually updated. And so I started, I started contemplating whether I should open PR to have a 
a timestamp, you know, an updated timestamp in there. And that's when I realized, well, wait a minute, we can use the time the updated timestamp to, to, to convey the exact same information. As long as the timestamp continually goes up each time and it gets updated every single time the resource is changed, then the exact value here on the discovery version technically doesn't matter. All that matters is that it changes and you can do a, a simple string compare or some sort of compare to say, okay, one's bigger than the other, therefore the bigger one is always newer, right? So that's why I thought, well, maybe we can do double duty and say, have just one field called updated and you can use a timestamp to determine that comparison check as well as get other information, meaning when it was actually updated in case that's information that's useful to you. So I put both in this PR. Obviously, we're not, I don't think we should accept both. I guess we could. But I was wondering if people had a preference for one way or the other or just wanted to sort of open it up there for discussion. I've seen clients come with really weird clock skew problems of like clocks that are like a month off. So... I don't remember if I put this in there or not, but I could have sworn that I put it something that said, oh, there's a typo there. It said um, that the time always has to go up. And I, and I thought about it this morning that I need to add an, uh, some additional statements here that says, um, exactly because of the Cox Q problem, that the server side is required to guarantee that every single time it gets updated, the time value always goes up by one. Because it is technically possible that if you had this thing, you know, sharded out across different backend servers, that one server is really, really slow or really, really behind for some reason, and that's the one who's going to do an update. So it's possible he could try to update with an older time by mistake if he tries to take his current time. But I think we need to add logic that that says no. When you do the update, you need to make sure that it's always incrementing, even if you have to lie about your current time, right? Okay. So yes. I think we, I think they need to add that logic in there. And so if, in cases where, um, where you're doing some sort of import action that, no, actually on, on an import action, you, you should take the value, whatever value is given to you, period. Yeah. So, so the, the, I think, I think where you're getting to is that um, this is not a version, this is an epoch. Yes. Well, it's, it's an incremental version that has no uh, semantic versioning except for you can compare it. The, mm -hmm. uh, the older one, or the, the most recent one, is a bigger number. How you come to that number is up to you. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think that's actually true for both of them. And from that perspective, yes. Yeah, the, 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 we, use, we use the epoch term for this in, um, in a few places. Um, where it's really this is an incrementing number, and uh, once you up, once you increment the number, then it's the next it's it's the the next version effectively, and and by what you increment the number is not important. Okay. It just needs to be higher. Now, when you say that, Clemens, are you talking about the discovery version or the update field or both? Well, I think you're proposing to merge the two. Well, I was, yeah, I, I'm leaning more towards getting rid of discovery version and just have update and have it serve both purposes, but I don't know whether that's being too tricky. I, um, it seems weird to just have updated sit there and for update, which is usually an informational fel a field to uh, uh, now play double duty. That, that feel like, like just let it sit there in, innocently being called updated um, and then being overloaded with semantics where s s the unsuspecting might not even care to read into the spec, um, that seems a little dangerous. And that's only because updated is so obvious, seems to be so obvious what that is, that uh, nobody might care to go and read the particular line and then find out, oh, this is actually a version. Right. If okay. you call this epoch, then it's weird enough <laughs> for for people to understand. Okay, so this is where I need to go to put the put the value for when this was updated, but also has some extra meaning. So this is where where the term epoch has like we 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 specifically use the term epoch because we wanted to create a term that is we want to pick a term that's a little weird, so that someone would actually be forced to go into the. Uh, um, um, uh, into the docs to figure it out. 
what do other people think? Is, is the intention that uh, the, this, this discovery API is, uh, I, sorry, is this update time based on when this particular API updated this record or when the producer, the, the originator of the record changed it? Say, say that one more time, sorry. All right, so like, let's, let's take the, the aggregation case. And the, the there's a, a, B, and C aggregating, and we're looking at C, and A changes it. Does that field get updated at A and B and C? Because, like, the intention was that the, so if A adds a record and then sets the epoch version, or whatever it is, uh, it, it, that should be the same version that propagates throughout the, the chain. But you might want to know when C actually updated the record based on A's values. So I could see a case where updated would be the time that this particular endpoint saw this particular update. And the epoch would be when this record was generated. Yeah, my original intention was that the updated value would, would be more like epoch in the sense that it's, if you're doing an import, it, it, you import the updated timestamp as well. It is not when this particular instance of this particular discovery endpoint saw an update. I would, I would consider these records immutable and it's actually created. So this particular thing at this particular epoch has been created at this particular time. So it sounds, sounds like you're saying we actually may want to do both have some sort of updated field to, to, that is specific to this particular discovery endpoint and have some other field, whether it's disk version or epoch to represent the version number or the version, yeah, version number thingy. <laughs> I, I care less about the update time, to be honest. Okay. So, well, so if, if so, okay, let me ask like, you this, Scott. If, if we, if that, we- That might with, make sense. No, Sorry. Well, but if we if we just went with that with, with epoch, would that and, and if we went with epoch and did not call it updated, is that clear to you that it's meant to be static when it get, or non change? Not, it, it's meant to be sort of in, an imported value, or even when if, if it's called epoch, do you think it should be uh, specific to this particular discovery endpoint? When I see epoch in an API, I consider that kind of the, the birth date of this record. Got it. So Clement, since you're the one that mentioned it, is epoch meant to be the creation time or do people also use it for updated time? It is the update time. It is, if it is the, the, the um, it is effectively a version counter. Yeah, I, I meant created in the sense of immutable records. So. You know, at, at each update is a new create of a new version of that thing. Yeah, it's a new the, the epoch. Fact. It's a e new epoch of validity for this. <laughs> the fact that it's updated doesn't doesn't really mean any anything to me because I might have missed uh, updates in the middle. So I don't actually care about updates at all. I just care about what's the current truth that I've seen. Yeah. Okay. So you're looking at the current epoch of this this record. That's the that's the that's the, the notion. Yeah, but I think it, what's interesting though, Scott, is it seems to me whether you actually are updating a record or you're creating a new record that's another version of this discovery or this discovery service, that almost feels like an implementation choice, right? Because I, I think what you're wanting, Doug, is uh, some sort of top level. Uh, the last time I was synchronized with all of the downstream producers is this time to see if the, the API is actually stale and you can trust the epoch. See, I'm not sure that's what I'm looking for. I, 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 to be honest, I, all I was looking for was, I think the same thing you were, which was a number or a, a, a value that we can do a simple compare against to see which one's bigger or newer. That's it. Okay. Right? Yeah, that's, the fact, that's what I want. 
yeah, the, the fact that I, that I overloaded updated, I thought was an interesting trick, but as, as Clemens pointed out, it might be a little too tricky and, and it could lead to confusion. So I'm okay with dropping updated. And my mind is now in the, in the phase of, okay, do we want it to be just a number, like just this version, or do we want it to be more like a timestamp like Epoch? But I think it's the same value. I think, it's the, 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 I think the value serves the same purpose in both cases. Yeah, I mean, like something like a rev might work too. Yes, rev the discovery version, either one. Yeah, that's just, you know, pick the right word, right? So, do Clemens, Epoch is a timestamp, right? Yes. Okay, so do people have a preference whether we go with some sort of numerical calendar? Well, so to, to be correct, it can be anything that is, that it has a greater, uh, uh, greater, equal, less. Uh, from a string it, comparison or numeric? Um, it doesn't even matter. I mean, really? I, we just need to have a, we need to have a clear rule. Like it needs to be bigger than. Interesting. So for, I pasted the, the links to the AMPP event streaming spec that we currently have in our committee and we use this for negotiating partition ownership um, on, on uh, event stream engines. And there it's, uh, it's an integer that just increments. Huh. So, okay, <clears throat> what do people think? Do you want a timestamp or do you want just a monotomically increasing integer? We can worry about the name later. I think we maybe we just set the rule loose and say this must be ever increasing. And if you choose to use an epoch value or you choose to use an increment, that's fine, and it, it, it adheres to the spec. We we could if we did that though. Would we at least need to scope it down to integer versus string or leave it loose? I I, I feel like there would be some people that were going to want it nailed down. I think it needs to be an integer. It has to be a fast compare thing. Okay. Any, so anybody disagree with it being an integer? Then we can figure out whether it's just a time integer versus a numeric integer. It could indeed be a Unix epoch. And so you have both. Both. You mean number of seconds since 1970? Yeah, that's yeah. Unix epoch. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah, right. Right. It turns out it has the same term. It has to say it has used the same term. Right. Okay. Not entirely by accident. Okay. So, okay. I think the proposal then in front of us is, uh, don't know the name yet, but it will be an integer. And we're not going to require it go up by one each time. It's just as long as the new version is greater than the old version. That sound right so far? Yeah. yeah so it doesn't have to go up by one because like, so this, my my thinking is that the, it's similar to the resource version in Kubernetes, and, and that's atomic across all resources in SED. So it goes up by one, but it's a global counter, and right. every resource might jump by hundreds based on how many resources are inside the cluster. Right. Yep. Okay. Any objection with heading that direction? This isn't a formal vote. I just want to make sure Bear no one's can think of some major objection to heading this direction and making an integer, and it just as long as it goes up each time. It's up to you to decide how much. Okay. And what about the name? People like Epoch? People want some variation of version or a, rev, a, re, a revision or something like that? Any preference? I'm pretty keen on Epoch. Okay. Wow. And what, was, what was that, Clemens? I said, wow, I'm excited. <laughs> okay, so the so, so if it, if it's an integer, then should it really be an epoch, which is a time? But you, the Unix epoch is an integer. Yeah, but the the um, I think Mark's question is if you call it epoch, you assume that you can turn it back into a time based on some known start time. Right. I'm not sure that's true. Like like for instance, in the MPP example that I just posted. And that's not the case. But did they do it wrong? <laughs> well, I wrote it, so. <laughs> oh, they're, they're, <laughs> it has to be right. Okay. <laughs> are, are, okay, so you just admitted your biases. <laughs> yeah, but 
but some other people, some other people in some other form, form already didn't object to it. Yeah, it can my, always be converted to a time. We just don't know the period and we don't know the start time. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> we well, updated it back in 1971. I think, I think the comment that, you know, you can arbitrarily uh, increment it as you, as you will doesn't give you any boundary, boundaries there. No, it doesn't. But it's, it could also be not, not by the wall clock. Yes, in, yes, this should be along. Okay, I, we, we'll do some double checking on whether we're allowed to do this, this Clemens hack of making it just any random number, um, if we call it epoch. But aside from that, assuming Clement isn't lying to us, um, anybody have any objection with epoch? <laughs> Thank you, it's okay. Yes. How about serial? Anybody want to comment on serial? I don't know what serial means, though. Uh, just from the DNS, uh, I think they have the upgoing serial. Um, it's arbitrary number should go up. What do people think? <laughs> Come on, someone speak up. Scott, you're coming up. Yeah. Here. I'm I'm thinking about it. I, I think serial. I don't have any strong objections, but I also I wouldn't think of this kind of like version version in history kind of time thing. Count yeah. makes me think of you're collecting something. I mean, this has a, a very particular function. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, right, like. We just want to sort all records that match the ID and pick the top one. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm leaning towards the epoch just because it, it sounds like we're so we're just so smart. It's such a fancy word. Yes. The other ones, <laughs> the other ones just have other possible meanings. This one's pretty clear to me. Yeah, you, that, and that was like to reiterate what I said. It's like what is since since we are binding particular semantics to this. Um, the the any any term which you look at and they're like ah that's it's obvious what that is um, like serial um, depending on where you come from uh, you will have some 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 idea of what you think that is and that's not true I don't think that's true with epoch okay so I, I think this is the current proposal at least that's what I'm leaning towards. And since it's my PR, I can do whatever I want. And thank you guys get to vote it up or down. <laughs> Anish, your hands up. Just, just a quick question. So when we, it doesn't matter who, what's, what's the type of this value, who increments it? Is it the client who updates the API or is it the server who listens to the update or create operation? So I do in here talk about two different cases. One is the generic case of just someone's just doing a, an update. Um, and that would be this, the server side would be doing the, the increment of this value. The, the exception to that is if you're doing some sort of import type of operation. In that particular case, the client who's doing the importing would be passing in the value and the server would just pick it up and not change it. Oh. But I do, talk, I do talk about those two different cases in there at some place. Okay, that means we do need the concept of a kind of, kind of a locking mechanism on this value. Potentially, but I think that's an implementation detail. Okay. I think client is a funny choice of word there. It, it's more of the the exporter. The client would be consuming the, the the discovery API to understand what producers are producing. And there's some other worker thing that's helping shuffle its source of truth into a discovery API for aggregation. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to go through and see if I can use a different word besides client, because you're right, it could be misleading. So hold on a minute. I'll, yeah, it's reminded to myself. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for the conversations or the thoughts. I will update the PR. But please um, take a look at the general text. Because I, I don't think, I don't think the, the, the spirit of what I wrote in here changes based upon today's conversation. So please... If, look over the rest of it. I'll try to update it at some point today to match what we just talked about though. 
All right, um, Clemens, Jim said he wasn't gonna be able to make it today, but he yeah. said you might have an update on what's been going on with the protocol stuff. Yeah, I do, um, but I need to make that super short because I need to rush out. Um, so, um, so yeah, we had a meeting um, yesterday, if I recall right, um, you know, days have no meaning. Um, and so this was largely about this was rehashing the discussion we had around, do we need a bag or don't we need a bag? And do we need namespacing and, and not namespacing? Um, so uh, in the discussion, I largely went and went back to the history of discussions that we had that some folks in, this, in that discussion have not had um, the uh, context on, on, on where we why we landed with the flat structure rather than having the extensions bag and while we why we then ended up having um, flat uh, values rather than allowing bags um, in in attributes um, all related to all the various different mapping problems we had with with headers etc so I explained the historical uh, historical context on this and and ultimately uh, the the result was that um, folks were okay with the um, um, with the PR um, as it stands right now. So the objections were basically um, really the same arguments we, we all went through with um, what, is, what, what is with collision risks of extensions? Um, would there ever be a case that a, an extension would be promoted into the main spec and there are pointed to the extensions that we already have in our, our repo and if it turns out that everybody is using, um, we're using the sequence number um, everywhere, then it's possible that that might end up being promoted into the main spec. And if that's so, then we don't want to break everybody's code. Um, so um, that you know, you can continue to use this this extension, uh, and you don't have to go and rewrite your code to use the newly christened official uh, embedded extension. Um, so that we keep compatibility. So effectively, all the arguments that we went through, um, we, we went through again because they are somewhat difficult to fit into um, the the proto structure. Um, and so the um, um, the result is that they are um, the the, the proto uh, spec. And we also went through the the special. Um, uh, you yeah, know, dual nature of the JSON uh, data field that if the outer event is JSON and then the data that's inside of it is also JSON, that it can really be a JSON object um, versus in the common case, uh, other common cases where there is a, um, um, there's a binary payload and that's clearer. Um, I also explained how we did the trick with uh, data underscore base 64, um, how we effectively use the underscore base 64 as an attribute indicating that this is a binary. Um, and the, and this, is, if this is reflected, that, that, that duality is really reflected in the proto, in the proto buff proposal um, by having a binary and then having a string that takes the same role as effectively a, a single JSON string that can also be used for um, a text-based um, uh, text uh, uh, content type. Um, so they have this duality of, of binary and a string, and then they also allow, similar to, to JSON, um, a bunch of uh, um, key value pair. Um, so that kind of parallels really from, a, from, a, from that perspective, the, um, the, the, um, uh, the, what the JSON spec also does. So, so that's, that's, that's a parallel. So ultimately, uh, I think what we get, went through is um, um, some unease um, from the folks who raised the objections, um, but they now better understand why where we where we were coming from and where why those decisions were made, and we ended up in a place where um, the the um, the proposal as it stands uh, um, has no further objections. So you actually think that they're going to just say the PR is ready to go as is? Uh, that was that was my understanding um, for, from coming out of the discussion. Yes. Cool. Okay. Any okay. questions for Clemens? Okay. I'd be interested in hearing whether Evan agrees with that because I know he didn't make the phone call. Okay. All right. And
in that case, you are free to go. Thank you, Clemens, for the update. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yep. See you next week. <clears throat> All right. With that, we are at the end of the agenda. Are there any other topics people would like to bring up? Okay. In that case, before we jump over to the interop call, um, Hankui, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay. And Movitz? Wait. No, I think they're gone. Okay, did I miss anybody for the uh, for the attendee list? Okay, in that case, if you're not interested in the discovery interop part of the call, you are free to drop. And thank you all for joining. I'll talk next week. We'll just give everybody a minute to bail if they want to. This actually may be a really quick call because I know Scott, um, <clears throat> he, he took off, probably went over to the uh, Key Native Steering Committee call. And I don't know if anybody's done any work on this one yet. Give us another 30 seconds or so. All right, uh, let's ask the uh, high order question here. <laughs> has anybody had actually, any, has anybody had any time to actually do any real coding on this and wants to share any, any information? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel bad too, because <laughs> I've been meaning to do it. Because um, it seems to me until people actually sit down and start to implement this stuff, we probably don't have a whole lot to talk about. Um, but that, and then, but to be honest, that is one of the reasons that I put together my PR about being more precise about the REST APIs, because that was sort of a, I figured that was a precursor to us being able to code this thing up to get agreement on what, the, how, what you know, what the return code is going to be and stuff like that. So I kind of indirectly worked on this a little. Um, but <clears throat> if no one has anything specific to talk about, we don't necessarily need to hang on the call. Are there any topics people want to bring up or is it just a matter of we just need to all find the time to to start working on this. Uh, yeah, I need to talk about something. So mm -hmm. when should we start discussing the scope for the subscription API? Uh, because that's something which is particularly of our interest and I would like to at least start in that area. I'm trying to think for the subscription API. Well, in order to, to, for you guys to head down the path of doing something in that space, do you plan on using the discovery spec first or just you're just interested in what the subscribe looks like? I mean, we would rather fit it eventually as a part of the ecosystem, but we would definitely would like to have some scope on the subscription manager beforehand. Okay. So, Honestly, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody's taken this first step of writing a proposal. If you're interested, you could put together a proposal for what the subscription API looks like for that. The, the, actually, hold on a second. Let me check something here. Because what's interesting about that is, I'm trying to remember what Clemens had, what the subscription API folks had for REST in here. Hold on a sec. It's also an open API spec. Mm -hmm. But is the open API spec sufficient to describe how to do a subscribe? But but I think this is a bit more descriptive than that. I mean, we can definitely go with open API. It's the same thing that why do we choose open API aspect versus a discovery API aspect. So I believe that that justification holds true for the subscription spec as well. I don't know, but that's just an opinion. Well, do you want to take a first pass at, just at writing up what an HTTP subscribe would look like? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I think I think that'd be a great first step because because it seems like if nothing else, that would be useful input into the creation of or not the creation, but the um, uh, what, what's going to go into the description API for HP, HTTP, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, does anybody else think that'd be premature to, to be looking at that? Klaus? I mean, it's, it's fine. I just want to. Um, yeah, I mean. It's like for the discovery API, someone has to try it out. Um, 
Yeah. And you, if you want to take a first pass at it, go for it. Yeah. Okay. But I also it. wanted to think from the scope perspective that what are we trying to solve with the subscription specification as well? And what are the key responsibilities of subscription manager as a concept? So if we have like some sort of scope definition on these things, then, then it would be a really easier thing to, you know, create a proposal or, you know, uh, yeah, take it forward. To, I'm trying to see whether, I can, to be honest, it's been so long since I read this document and try to see whether he mentioned that in here. So what exactly is the, the question? So from the subscription manager point of view, like how are we, how are we going to start implementing this? So even if we start implementing this, uh, is, is there a mechanism that we can dynamically pick these implementations of uh, XYZ subscription managers? For example, if we switch between different messaging systems like Kafka, NAT, SAMQP, do we create relevant subscription managers for every messaging implementation? How, how does it work? So. I would like to outline these kinds of details before we start implementing that. It's just an API definition. I mean, what, what you do behind the scenes is up to you, I guess. Mm -hmm. We have defined the protocol specific uh, additional parameters for those um, different protocols, mm -hmm. HTTP, and, MQP, and so on. And how does this API uh, compares to, to the subscription API of Knative eventing. So Knative eventing also has its own implementation of subscription API. So is it eventually going to conform to this? Where do you see the Knative API, uh, subscription API? Oh, the messaging uh, API group has a subscription API, right? So that's very specific to the Knative channels, but still it's a subscription API. Uh, yeah, I think it would be closer to the um, Triggers in Knative, I think, but trigger and broker. But um, in Knative is only HTTP, so here are the, all the protocol specifics. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a bit confusing because they have also a subscription API, which is part of the messaging API group, and broker yeah. and trigger are part of the eventing uh, API group. And then now we have this generic subscription API definition. definition so it's just like, I, that's why I wanted a bit overview about the scope of this. Yes, you're right. I mean, uh, the subscription in Knative is just a messaging level. So mm -hmm. it's not even assuming cloud events as far as I know. Yep, exactly. And here, obviously, these are cloud events uh, subscriptions. So we, I think there's also a section describing the possible filters. So far, we just have a very uh, basic filter dialect. So I, I would assume that there some additional work is needed also something I, whenever I find the time for it, wanted to um, do some more work on. As so far, we just have uh, um, exact match or prefix suffix uh, uh, filters for the cloud events attributes. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug, what about you? How do you see this taking I, shape? I'm still trying to wrap my head around the subscription API in Knative because because <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't. <laughs> I, I'm probably thinking about this wrong, but I don't think of that as, as a subscription API. Yeah, it's, it's basically a subscription towards a channel. They, it's it pops up, I mean, it pops yeah. up, you also have a subscription term. It's just- it, Exactly. Yeah, but even then, I, 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 like I said, I'm, I'm probably thinking of it wrong, right? I, to me, it's, it's just, <clears throat> it's not quote an API, it's you create a resource in Kubernetes. Yeah. That's an API. It is, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know, I know. It's an API, I agree. Well, it, well what's interesting to me is, Yes, the Kubernetes has an API, but you're not really doing a subscription per se. You're creating a resource. And I understand I'm, I'm probably thinking about it wrong because, because semantically, yes, you are creating a subscription. It's just, it's so difficult for me to think of the Kubernetes API as a, as a subscription API. But it's, isn't it the same here? I mean, you also create uh, something that has an ID, a subscription ID. I know, I know. It's a mental block I have. I, I, <laughs> I agree. I'm, I'm thinking about this wrong. It's just I, I couldn't get past that for some reason in my head. I mean, this is exactly why I would like to start in at least an early discussion that what should be the scope of this. And because once we have a clear picture about the scope of subscription API and the relevant managers, then we can start thinking about certain implementations. So I think an, an important distinction in this document is this um, uh, push style and pull style 
uh, okay. part that is described. I don't know, it's somewhere here <laughs> or a bit above. I'm not sure. Um, so mentioning that there's quite a few protocols like uh, MQTT, MQP, and so on um, have some native subscription support already. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that's if you do pull style, even for MQP, you could still have push style subscriptions when you have to um, provide the address to push an event to uh, when you subscribe. So the, the, the subscription manager is always needed if you if you have an out of band subscription API. Let me ask you guys a slightly different question. That's maybe why I'm 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 struggling with thinking of the Knative stuff as a subscription API. Mm -hmm. Are are you guys assuming that when we talk well, that when we actually formalize the API for subscription, that it's going to look more of an RPC-ish kind of a thing, or is it going to look more like Kubernetes where you're creating an object? I mean, that completely is now an implementation detail, right? Because how are we going to implement this API? It's based on what platform we choose, right? But a subscription yeah. needs some kind of um, life cycle. So if well, Be it an RPC style or a REST style uh, API, you will still have something like a create and delete. Yeah, but I guess it's... Subscribe, it, unsubscribe. Yeah, but I guess it's... it's Again, this is probably just the way I choose to think of it. It's just to me... The, the, oh, never mind. I just need to get over it. I, it's just, it's very difficult for me to, to look at the the REST style as... It, it's just, I can't put into words what I'm thinking. It, 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 it seems weird to me to force the user, meaning the client, to think of it as I'm creating a resource someplace. I understand technically that's exactly what's happening. All right, that's, that's usually what the, every implementation is going to do. It's going to create some kind of resource, whether it's a formal resource or just an entry in a database. It's a resource, and I understand that's what's going to happen. But the mental model from the user's point of view is it oh, I'm creating a resource or is it I'm asking for a subscription or am I asking for events, right? And it, there's a, it, I don't know why, but in my head, there's a slightly different way to think about it from the user's perspective. And, and, I, and I don't know whether, we've, mm -hmm. whether it makes a difference or if it does make a difference if we decided which way that we're gonna make the user think about these things. Okay, I, I think I get that what you're trying to intend. So you basically, imply towards the central subscription broker what the workload can basically query or request and show its intent in terms of subscribing to a topic. And it definitely gives you uh, the relevant details about how the messaging system can interact with it rather than creating a resource. So it's mainly like requesting a broker Let's, let's not call it like any specific messaging white broker. It's just like a subscription broker. Uh, so you, the, the workload says that, okay, I'm interested in XYZ event and it calls the broker using this specification and the broker basically deals with orchestrating the messaging system to this workload. Is mm -hmm. that are we, what we are trying to intend out of this? Yeah, and, and, and I think also another piece of it is, and this is one thing that's always really bothered me about Kubernetes is, Kubernetes exposes the underlying data model to the user. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I want to do that in this, mod, in this spec, right? I think, I think we clearly need to define the shape of whatever thing gets sent back and forth between the client and the server. I agree, we obviously need to define that, otherwise you have zero interoperability. However, I don't want to necessarily force all implementations to then store what's sent on the wire into their backend server. They could choose if they wanted to, but they should also be able to translate it into their own data model, mm -hmm. right? And, I, and, and that's something, I don't know, like I said, I, I need to think about all this all in my head, but I'm not sure whether that influences our decisions here or not, right? Because if you think of this as, oh, I'm creating a resource, I think people are gonna assume you're defining the data model for the server. Whereas in my mind, RPC is more like, here's what I want. How you do it on the back end, I don't give a crap but here's my data, I'm just gonna send over a chunk of JSON. And therefore we don't have to fight about what the shape of what's on the wire because 
because at some point, let me put it this way. At some point, I think Scott is going to ask for a status and a spec section of these resources. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> right? but it's uh, subscribing to something means you, you, you create some state and you later have to refer to that state if you ask again or want to delete that subscription. Unsubscribe. Yes, yes but... I, I, everything you said there, I agree with Klaus, but does that mean that we have to actually have a spec and a status section simply because some people are going to want to implement this on Kubernetes? Right? I, don't, I personally wouldn't want that. I th unless, unless for some reason spec and status makes 100% perfect sense to the end user. Right? To me, as an end user, when I look at a subscription API, I would want to be able to pass in, you know, like what I'm showing here on the screen, right? They, I'm going to pass in, I'm going to pass in some information about the subscription, right? What are the what is the filter criteria? What is the bucket I want if it's a cloud object storage, right? I'm going to pass in all this information. When I turn around and do a get on something to find out the status of my subscription, personally, I don't want to see spec versus status. I don't give a crap. But that's something uh, we can still. I mean, we don't have to adhere to those uh, Kubernetes. Uh, yeah. Um, Data so, yeah. I agree we don't have to, but, but the, the thing that worries me is when we start talking about creating objects, I think a lot of people's minds are going to jump to, oh, well, we need to decide what the server side implementation is going to look like. Yeah, and even I started thinking in that direction uh, in the moment. So for example, if we def define, or oh, let's say the workload says that I want to interact via the Kafka protocol, now does it have to create a client for Kafka or AMQP or any other protocol? Because in my, in my perception, how I see the end result is like the messaging system should be, or there should be a mechanism that the messages are getting dispatched to the client rather than client pulling it. At, I mean, of course, there are two mechanisms in this case. That's up to the, uh, I mean, up to you to choose the, the appropriate protocol. Mm -hmm. If you choose a messaging protocol, then we, subscribing we to, to something, pulling it, Depends, but it's usually the way to go. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I don't think we're going to resolve this on this call right now. But I, I think the short, I think the, the short answer, Anish, is yes. If you want to write a proposal, I think everybody would love that. Okay. Whichever way you choose to go. Cool. Okay. I mean, I, I can just put on some things which are there in my head. So let's see if we can achieve that. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, think... to, to me, forward progress is even just somebody putting out some really weird idea and everybody shoots it down. At least that gets everybody talking so we know what people don't like. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, I, I think I can start that. That's a good vacation thingy for me. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Anything else you guys want to talk about relative to uh, the uh, interrupt? So I think for the interrupt, it would be good if someone also tried to uh, implement the subscription API. I think that was the intent, right? Because Scott wants yeah, to- Yeah, we, we put it on some... the list last time, I think. But so far, all the names are behind discovery, I think. Um... I mean, did someone show up who also said, yeah, I, I will do the subscription? I don't know if anybody actually volunteered for it. I think it was just sort of implied that it's going to be included yeah. as part of our work. I mean, count me in. I, I, I did reach out to Scott, but I think he was pretty swamped uh, last week. So let's see if I can catch a hold of him next week. Okay, that'd be good. Okay, anything else? If not, I'm going to jump over to the uh, Knative Steering Committee call, see how they're going. Oh, okay. I see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's going to be a fun phone call. Yeah. All right. Okay. I guess that's it then. Have a good day, everybody. Okay. You too. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.